Hey guys, welcome back to the Historian's Craft. So, um, I know it's been a while since I uploaded the last video in the uh, Age of the Samurai series, but we're gonna keep going with it now, after I got the rest of the stuff kind of outlined, um, and then gradually the series will finish. So, what I want to do in this video is I want to talk about Japanese mythology and some of the origin myths of ancient Japan and how violence is kind of, you know, fitted into the overall conception of Japanese creation mythology, where it comes from, because as we're going to see as the series kind of progresses, um, and as we move out of ancient Japan, the samurai just kind of show up one day. And this is mirrored pretty well in the Japanese creation myths. Because gods and everything else just kind of show up one day. So what you are looking at uh, on the left-hand side of the screen is a scroll. And what you're seeing here are the gods Izanagi and uh, Izanami. So there were multiple different... The word is different depending on what you read. I'm going to say generation. There are multiple different generations of uh, Japanese deities. Many of them are the children of the previous generation. So, Izanagi and Izanami are uh, divine twins. Well, not twins. They are brother and sister, rather. Uh, and they are the third set. They are the third generation. So, the, so, Japanese creation mythology basically goes like this. At one point in time, there was what the Japanese term, you know, heaven, or what we understand rather to be heaven, uh, this kind of celestial plane somewhere up in the clouds. There was earth, but there was no land. There was a vast ocean. And one day, Izanagi and I Izanami are kind of peering down through the clouds and they see the ocean. They kind of wonder what it is. Uh, so they take this jeweled spear, and this is what you can see in the scroll. And they jab it down into the ocean, so right from the beginning we have, you know, violence, there's a, there's a weapon. Uh, and they stir the ocean, they pull it back, and as water drips off the head, it drops back into the ocean. From this, land is born. Land rises, comes up out of the ocean. Again, we have this theme of stuff just kind of coming up out of nowhere. The gods just were there. In the beginning, so was land. And both of these gods descend. Eventually, um, they discover each other's gender. They mate. They have kids. Izanami dies by giving birth to the fire god. Uh, Izanagi is furious, so he kills his child. And then he pursues his dead wife into the... Land of Darkness, Yomi. Um, and this other photograph here is one of the traditional entrances the Japanese believe led to Yomi. He goes down there, he finds his dead wife, and he's horrified by her because she's dead. So she's decaying now. Uh, she is not clean. She's not pure anymore. She's been soiled by death, and he flees. He bathes himself in a stream, and from the droplets coming off his body, we have three other gods born. The two important ones for the purposes of this video uh, are Amaterasu, who is on the left, she's the sun goddess, and Tusanu, her brother, the god of storms. The basic, I guess, interaction between Amaterasu and Tusanu is as follows. So Amaterasu um, is the sun goddess. She is the... Lord is not the right word, but she, she's one of the higher ranking, if not the highest ranking gods. Uh, or kami, if you want to use the Japanese term, in Japanese mythology. Susanoo is up there, because he's her brother, but he's a lower rank. Uh, but the two of these deities have a very intense sibling rivalry. And one day, Susanoo insults Amaterasu. So Izanagi is angered. And he expels Susanoo from heaven. Susanoo later apologizes and he poses a challenge uh, for Amaterasu. Basically, each of them are going to take an object from each other and create gods. So, three gods are born from Susanoo's sword, five are born from Amaterasu's necklace. 
uh, because Amaterasu's necklace gave birth to five gods, even though Susanoo was the one holding it, Amaterasu was the one who wins the challenge. So Susanoo is furious at this. So what does he do? Uh, well, he devastates her rice paddies. He destroys her farmland. He tears a hole in... Well, actually, this comes next. He defecates on Amaterasu's floor. This angers her and upsets her very much. He then leaves her house, climbs up onto the roof, tears a hole in the roof, flays a, a pony from the uh, anus to the head. So he flays it backwards, which to the Japanese in ancient times, this would have been considered uh, unclean because you're not starting at the head. And he throws the dead horse inside. This basically pisses off all the gods, um, and Susanu is fully exiled, and then Amaterasu flees into a cave. The world is shrouded in darkness uh, for a, a good long while, but eventually she's enticed out, so she comes out of the cave, the sun comes back, and then there is light again in the world. So, that happens, and Susanu is exiled, like, basically permanently. Where does he go? Uh, well, he leaves heaven, and he goes down to the Japanese islands. There is a specific spot in Japan where people believe he did actually come down. Um, it's not important for the topic of this video. I'll probably do another video on it at some point. Um, but what basically happened when he goes down to the Japanese islands is he encounters this elderly family, and they tell him that seven of their eight daughters are dead. They've been killed by the Yamata dragon, the Yamata no Orochi, the uh, eight-forked serpent whose eight heads are so large that each one fills an individual valley. Susanu sympathizes with them, so he agrees to basically go kill the dragon. So Susanu's plan to get rid of this dragon is to get a drunk on sake, which he does, and then he kills it. And as he is striking this, and as he's stabbing the dragon with his sword, he hits something hard. Doesn't really know what it is. So he cuts the dragon open, and he pulls out Kusanagi no Surugi, uh, the grass-cutting sword. Susanu then takes that sword, and he goes back to Amaterasu, and he offers her the blade as a peace offering. So, that's one of the founding sets of myths for Japanese mythology. Uh, why does it relate to the samurai? Well, if you study anthropology, one of the things it teaches you is that Cultures are logical. No matter how strange something might seem to an outsider, or how reprehensible something might seem, there is always initially a reason for a society developing some kind of institution to deal with some kind of a problem. Um, you know, cultures have similar issues to solve. But how cultures solve those problems are going to be different depending on who you are, where you live, and your environment. In ancient Japan, Violence was seen as a reprehensible act. Violence is also seen as unclean. Um, this relates to Shinto, where there's a huge dividing line between acts that are clean and pure and good, and acts that are unclean and dirty and evil. Um, but violence has no place in ancient society. But violent individuals can be useful to society. So, why does that matter for the for the origins of the samurai? Well, in ancient Japan, um, the early Japanese state basically wants to try to mimic China. And one of the ways it tries to mimic China is by implementing a forced conscription uh, in order to create a military. This doesn't work. There are multiple reasons for it, which we'll get into as we move forward. Um, but if this military isn't working, then the court and the aristocrats have to seek out some other means for an army. Well, what does Japanese mythology teach the ancient Japanese? Violence has no place in society, so Susanu has no place among the gods, so he's banished. But he's violent. He's not afraid to get his hands dirty. So his violence and his violent tendencies, if they're harnessed correctly, are able to be used for the good of society, like when he kills the dragon. He helps the old family. Well, the court and aristocrats understood that violent individuals existed in Japan. Uh, sometimes these are like rough-and-tumble warriors. 
Sometimes these are criminals. Sometimes these are hunters, trappers, fishermen, people that aren't afraid to get their hands dirty. Whether that means fighting somebody or actually murdering them. So what you do is a lot of these violent individuals were brought into the fold of the Japanese aristocracy basically as their retainers. This largely is where the first samurai come from. Um, and this is something I kind of wanted to focus this video on because it's very, very easy when you study the rise of some kind of a military class or occupation, whatever, um, to look at it in just secular terms. But many societies throughout time have been deeply religious or at the very least, if not religious, certainly they held folk beliefs, uh, which impacted their culture and how people behaved. And usually, there are lessons and teachings to be found in those mythologies and, you know, folklores. So, I'm going to end this video here, um, but hopefully this just kind of reinforces to you that when the Japanese start hiring samurai, which we'll talk about in the next couple videos, it's not something that necessarily, like, arises out of nowhere. There were precedents for doing this in Japan's mythology.